after this introduction from, from Cayetano, we have seen all the challenges and opportunities we have uh, from an operator perspective for, for the future. Uh, we will enter into this uh, first panel session of today, which is named uh, Future Cellular Radio Technologies. Uh, the, the format of this panel, we will have uh, three, three speakers, so three, three presentations that will last around 20 minutes each. We will have uh, around 10 minutes uh, for questions after each of the presentation, and a last slot of half an hour for an open discussion. So I would encourage all of you to be active. Uh, I think we have a very good opportunity to, to talk with all the experts on the, on the matter. So our, our first speaker is Misa Dollar. I will not go through the whole curriculum, it's, it's quite impressive. He's a leading the intelligent energy group at the CTTC in Barcelona, with main focus on smart grids and green radios. He's been working on wireless sensors, machine-to-machine, -machine, femto, cooperative, and cognitive radios. He's also CTO of World Sensing, a award-winning company in the smart cities market. And prior to that, he's been a senior research, research expert in the R&D division of France Telecom, and also lecturer at uh, King's College in London, where he earned his PhD. He's a pioneer uh, research in distributed cooperative space-time encoded communication systems and solutions, and he has a number of over 100 uh, technical journals, publications, 13 patents. He has uh, collaborated in the writing of 19 books and a number of international courses, and he's also fluent in six different languages. So, Misa, the floor is yours. Now, it is said that um, we completely overestimate what we can do within five years, and uh, we completely underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Now, this talk is about that we completely underestimate what we should do over the next 10 years. It all started really four years ago when I had a coffee with the uh, CTO, then CTO of Alvarion, and uh, we thought, you know, let's do something nice, fun project, something with impact. We started brainstorming, and we did some number crunching, and finally we figured out that actually IMT Advanced got it all wrong already in 2007, just doing some very basic mathematics. So we started listing down, OK, what is IMTA asking for? Peak rates is OK. The average rates, though, are very lousy in uplink and in downlink. Now, if you look at a typical system rollout, uh, Telefonica or any other of the uh, uh, network operators, at a reasonable cost, what you get is that you can place a base station some every 500 meters, and uh, you, know, you would use probably meaningfully some 40 megahertz bandwidth, and with the average rates you get, it's about 100 megabits per second per square kilometer. That sounds really impressive. Actually, in 2000, probably it sounded very impressive. Still in 2007, it sounded impressive, but if you start doing the numbers, what we actually need, things start to become uh, very itchy very quickly. Now, look at the uh, urban density, European cities. You know, the, these are not really urban dense cities. You've got like averages like 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 people. I didn't even put up Mumbai. Mumbai is like 28,000 people per square kilometer. Now, if we have a classical uh, football match, we have 90,000 people per square kilometer. So you get the, uh, you get the exercise. Uh, it's a lot of people, and in peak hours, we have estimated some 8,000 uh, uh, people per square kilometer. We estimated that 20% of them in 2007 would sign up uh, to broadband and 10% would actually be using it at any time and you end up with a capacity need of one gigabit per second per square kilometer. Now that is an order of magnitude above what IMT, the forward thinking body, has been asking for. So we had a problem here. And this is where it all started really. And I don't even put here the capacity needs in suburban areas because uh, you all realize, and I presume that you know from tele Telefonica statistics, you realize very quickly that you know the iPhone and all these smartphones are a, a, a game-changing thing right now. So capacity is not only needed downtown; capacity is needed everywhere. So I'm actually very annoyed if I go on holidays in the Pyrenees and I can't work because I don't have 3G. 
Okay, so you understand that capacity is currently really a limiting factor. But this is not all of it. Now that slide is for Ronaldo. <laughs> so we have um, another problem here. We have to decide how do we approach the whole thing, you know, from a zoomed out holistic point of view. And this is what we're discussing with Zev also. And we have been discussing with various people, including with Ronaldo who's in the audience over the years. Where do you put your emphasis? Interface, architecture, both. How much on each of that? Now, there are two, uh, two screamer facts, actually, on this slide and one insight, really. Now, the first thing, we have something which is very similar to Moore's law, which is Cooper's law, which says, essentially, every, every 30 months, capacity uh, doubles for the past 100 years. That is, uh, that is impressive, and this puts a lot of pressure, actually, for the next 30 years, because I would presume that uh, you know, that trend would continue, meaning if we have increased capacity from 1974 to 2011, actually the statistic for 2006, uh, by a factor of million, I would expect that in the year 2045, that would still be a factor of million on top of what we have today. So that's a challenge for your engineers beyond 2021. Okay, another thing we have uh, on this slide is actually when you break down the gains. And that, there are some shocking insights, really. Uh, the first insight is that the physical layer, you know, everything which we have done uh, so meticulously in our area with Shannon starting coding, modulation, et cetera, et cetera, only has an impact of uh, a five, okay, on this one million capacity increase over the past uh, 40 years. Um, in other words, now I'm really bringing this to the edge of this conversation to really, uh, you know, get maybe a little discussion out of that. In other words, if we used on off keying of 1912, we probably would be close to the capacity we have today. Or in other words, if we had given GSM the opportunity of using, instead of the 120 kilohertz band for every channel, the five megahertz of, uh, of UMTS, or the 100 megahertz, which we're talking about LTA, probably, with the same interface, you know, Gaussian minimum shift keying, we would have the same capacity, more or less orders of magnitude. That is just a guess, and I'll leave that in the room. Now, the other insight we get is that um, the spectrum has an impact of 25. Now, that is much bigger than the physical layer. Uh, and what is astonishing is that actually the whole infrastructure game, making the cells smaller and smaller over time, had an impact of 1,600. 1,600 versus a factor of five. Now, if you go down to the numbers, how much money have you put into the actual activities, meaning how much money has Telefonica put over the years into making small sm uh, cells smaller, into uh, lobbying for spectrum and paying for the license, and investigating in the physical layer and all the radio access network technologies, you see that things change very quickly. So that is a rough estimate. And actually, that is an estimate which is for Nordic country uh, like the UK and the Germany, where they have paid a fortune for the spectrum. So Telefonica has paid a little less, and uh, so the, the megahertz actually go down. What we see here is if you, for every dollar, for every euro you guys put into making the infrastructure smaller, you get out a euro and a half or two euros. And for every euro you put into uh, designing a new physical layer, you get out 20 cents. Okay, I'm telling you this because I'm running our company and so we have to make a decision on impact on a daily basis. So the message of this slide is, uh, in my opinion, is rather spend your efforts in trying to build a good architecture, make things smaller, smaller sizes, how does it work all together? And this is eventually, uh, essentially the trend we're observing. Now, revenue versus infrastructure cost, and uh, you know the upper part you know pretty well, I presume, and the lower part is something I'll talk about. Now, what we observed over time is, you know, voice was predominant, and uh, voice and revenues have been always going a little bit along because you know you charge for the voice traffic, which was linear for the SMSs, etc. But ever since the data traffic really took off, um, you had to introduce a flat rate, and with a flat rate, your revenues essentially became flat. There's no magic to that, and you end up with a graph where data traffic goes up and revenues just remain flat. Now, the only problem is to support these data rates, of course, you need an infrastructure traditionally in place which is costly. So to support that, now I don't have a laser pointer right here, but uh, if you see that um, the traffic volume curve down there and you see the network cost uh, curve, which is the traditional approach, you see that you have a problem there because uh, your revenues essentially uh, just disappear. So you have three, three choices, really. Okay, you have three choices. First choice is, is uh, you charge, actually, the traffic which goes over your network. 
which I think is a choice. Telefonica is pursuing pretty well, so there have been deals with Google. Um, it is fairly unprecedented in our community, I have to say, but that I think is a good move because immediately your revenue starts to be correlated to the actual traffic volume. Good move. Second one you have is uh, the choice is you actually start to become a, a service provider. Essentially, everybody's trying it for the past 10 years uh, with uh, various success uh, for two reasons. The first reason, I think, is because uh, operators traditionally are not service providers. And I realize this now in my company, you know, if you're not really specialized in one thing, it's very difficult to migrate to something else. And the second problem is that the, the whole license game, uh, paying uh, several billion dollars and euros for a, a virtual piece of uh, electromagnetic spectrum has killed off a lot of, a lot of innovation. And therefore, things are a little bit limping and eventually have given space to companies like Apple and uh, uh, Google. Now, the third, the third way you can do it is just get the cost down of your infrastructure. And this is really what I'm going to talk about today. And we have done the maths with some operators in, in Europe. And we figured out if you want to provide one gigabit per second per square kilometer, and you do that by using HSDPA and an optical uh, backhauling link, these are the costs, 3 million euros CAPEX and you know, uh, about 63,000 euros OPEX. If you go instead on the backhaul, which is a uh, microwave, the uh, CAPEX is more or less the same, but the OPEX goes uh, a little up. Now, to make this whole game viable, we figured out you need to, you need to run a half uh, capital expenditure and about a quarter on the operational expenditure. Okay, so we started crunching the architecture, which would obey precisely these requirements. And it was done within a project called um, um, Bungie. Now, that's my, my only uh, small slide, really. We kicked it off eventually. Then it started, we'll finish actually soon, next June. And we came up with an architecture which is an excellent uh, byte per euro ratio. And in addition, it gives you the ability to support a capacity density of one gigabit per second per square kilometer. Now, I don't want to go over these uh, details. Let me just visualize this very quickly. What have we done? The, the magic of the whole thing is, is to try to minimize the expensive equipment. Okay, so we have very little, very expensive equipment, which is what we call the hub base station. It is fairly big. I'll show you later a picture. It's a very, it's fairly big beast. You have to put it above the rooftop. It supports 24 beams, so it's a very aggressive frequency reuse, okay? It is uh, dual, dual polarized, so it gets, uh, you know, it gets all the uh, diversity you need. And it serves, essentially, in each of the beams, a few of the access base stations, which are cheap, very cheap, a bit like the relays in the, in the, in the LTE specs. Now, these relays or the access base stations are essentially below rooftop level, they're not mobile, they're just uh, you know, put there. And they, again, are serving essentially the users. Now, if we come to the actual architecture, you see that we have uh, the hub base station here has a radiation pattern of 24 beams serving essentially over backhaul network the access base station, which in turn, via the uh, access network, uh, serve eventually the mobile stations. Now, that, is, that was number one. This is really to get the capacity right, and this is also to get the, uh, the cost down. A another thing we did is uh, we did a very aggressive uh, joint access and backhaul design. Now, this is the thing I think people have, are talking about right now, and it's a very, a very popular topic, but think about it. In 2007, essentially, we really realized that, uh, you know, if you really want to make sense out of this, you have to use all spectrum available, license, license exempt, um, you know, go up to 60 gig if you can, and uh, often you have to use the same type of frequency in the, in the backhauling and the access link, so you need to optimize it, jointly optimize, and this is essentially what we did. Uh, another thing we did is uh, we worked very strongly on the self-organizing aspect, and I'll come to this in a, in a moment. There are a few other innovative elements which I don't want to dwell on that. Now, what, what happens with the deployment here? You have a few choices, really, and uh, you know, we came up with loads of different deployment architectures for regular and irregular networks, and uh, that is an example for the, uh, for the Barcelona rollout. So you would put, essentially, the hub base station just up on the building. It would serve uh, the access base station down in the roads so where each block is about 100 uh, to 200 meters long. Um, and uh, the access base stations would actually, among themselves, communicate with a, with a 60 gig backhaul. 
So essentially, the 60 gig backhaul allows us to treat, uh, you know, the, the, the backhauling problem as a, as a black, black hole because the data can just be provided in either direction without any problem because it's a, it's a heavy over-provisioning of the, of the wireless link. The whole problem really is essentially, once we have chosen the architecture, is essentially to start doing the whole management of the game. And uh, managing an architecture which is composed of many elements is, is very tricky, and clearly we can't do it manually, and uh, we all understand that so on self-organizing networking is a must. One of the constituents and real favorites for making this happen is essentially cognitive radio, and we will have loads of talks about this uh, during the day today. The only problem is that cognitive has been actually abused before it started doing anything meaningful. So if you go to IEEE Explorer and you'll download, you know, the papers which claim to be cognitive, 95% of them have nothing to do with cognition at all. They're opportunistic at best. So in a sense, like, if my uh, interference goes above a certain threshold, um, I start to lower my uh, transmission power. This is opportunistic. It has nothing to do with cognition. Cognition is really, if you take some intelligent and forward-looking decision uh, based on learned and past observations. Or let me put it in a, in a very colloquial way. If you have a cognitive system in place, it is able to survive under conditions it was initially not designed for. Okay? So think of us humans. We were not designed to fly, still we fly. We're not designed to dive, and still we dive. So we are really cognitive. We uh, survive in environments we're actually not supposed to be. Uh, the only problem is that our learning curves are very long. Okay, so I, I, I spend uh, about a year and a half teaching my daughters how to walk. Okay, we don't have a year and a half to wait until my base station knows how to operate. I'm still teaching them how to cross uh, just on the green light and on the red light. So we have, a, we have a problem here in terms of the convergence speed, as we call that, okay? No, no matter which really, truly cognitive technique you take. So we have worked on that because when I was at France Telecom, we realized that you know, every, every time you start to talk to the real engineers, they just didn't want to hear anything about cognitive. They didn't want to hear anything about uh, machine learning and all these artificial intelligence stuff, which is actually quite intriguing, simply because it takes ages to get the system up and stable and running. So we worked on that. We introduced what we call the dotative networking paradigm, where essentially people or nodes not just learn, but they actually teach each other. So once you're an expert in something, you teach. And this really reflects very well our school society uh, uh, paradigm and works really well. So convergence is uh, improved by orders of magnitude. I'm going to show that to you. So the cognitive cycle from acquisition, decision to action is extended via a dosative element where now actually base stations, nodes in the system start teaching each other about what they have learned about their environment and their decision taking in the past. We have simulated that, so we have taken several layouts, I'm just giving you one of them, uh, put really the hub base station on top, a very fre aggressive frequency reuse, we put four access base station per beam, and we let run the whole thing. And we figured out that if you uh, dimension the system well, it turns out, and you have everything running autonomously, meaning every single access base station is taking its own decisions. There's no uh, actual exchange of data in the, uh, of control traffic between hub base station and access base station or between access base stations. It's all completely autonomous, really self-organizing in a true sense. And what we are, we're trying to do is to ensure that the backhaul capacity is not smaller than the access capacity because otherwise you have dropped packets going either way. So therefore, we have, uh, we have managed to get them pretty close, and that system converges very quickly based on uh, learning, autonomous learning, and exchanging of information. And then we have also, just give you a little glimpse on all the results we got, we compared the cognitive approach with the dosative approach, and we figured out that we got down from 20,000 iterations until something converged, uh, which is a cognitive, to 4,000, um, which is quite an order of magnitude, and is essentially speeding up the whole stabilization process within the coherence times you need well, of the dynamics of the network. So I'm coming to, uh, to my end. Just uh, wanted to show you, you know, we are, we've been very active in the project. So um, from the theory, which I've outlined, from the concept to the theory, from the simulations, et cetera, we went on to broad prototyping. So what you see is Cobham's high-capacity multi-beam hub base station with the beam pattern. Uh, very aggressive uh, beam pattern based on Butler matrix, and it works pretty impressively well. 
We have uh, Alvarian's uh, SISO access base station, which you see on the left-hand side, and CDTC is our very impressive MIMO uh, system, which allows you essentially to run and test the whole access system. We used uh, Cyclus, um, it's a company in Israel, a very, very cost-efficient 60 gig backhaul. It's a very small element, it's about this size, just mount it, uh, you need line of sight, but 60 gig, you know, it works up to two kilometers, one kilometer, it depends on the weather, weather availability, but they are pretty, uh, pretty impressive results, and above all, it's very, very cheap. We uh, went further, so from prototyping to standardization, we are right now pushing uh, through, you know, the whole concept, the architecture, et cetera, in, in Etsy. We have a call coming up next Tuesday, actually, at uh, 2 p.m., so if there's a chance of anybody of you being interested, please join the call and uh, join the discussion on the, on the architecture. Now, from the standards to practice, we're going, we're going to actually trial the whole thing. We're going to roll it out, so we're going to show the world that we can do it, one gigabit per second per square kilometer at a cost as we promised it would happen. It will be in Tel Aviv. And also we are planning for the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So uh, this is under discussion because of various issues with the frequency, et cetera. So if anybody off Telefonica happens to be in this room who can help us here, um, please come to see me because uh, that I think would be a major, a major thing with media coverage, et cetera, et cetera. So we are very much working towards that. Okay, let me uh, really finish off here and um, what we realized in, with ZEV, actually, these four years ago, is that really the capacity needs are very far off reality. And, uh, and that was even before the iPhone really took off. And, and, and my suspicion is that even today, uh, what we will be projecting over these days is going to be probably far off by at least an order of magnitude what will happen by 2021. For some reason, there's nothing we can do about it. It just happens. Um, my other argument is that unless you really have uh, breakthrough physical layer techniques, and there are a few, visible light communication, gigahertz communication, maybe super MIMO, Bell Labs, et cetera, I, I don't know. But uh, unless you have something which really improves things by a factor of 10, rather work on the, on the architecture. Get the architecture done and get the price down. Um, management is a problem, so self-organizing is clearly taken off in the next years. It's a prime issue also in 3GPP. And what we have done essentially is come up with an architecture with LTE, LTA, or WiMAX agnostic, we happen to run on WiMAX, but you understand very well that it is pretty uh, indifferent to all. Um, we really can provide this capacity anywhere we want at any time, mainly in urban environments, uh, cost efficient and um, autonomous, really. And the whole, the whole aim of the exercise was really, you know, the hope maybe that uh, the year 2011, in a sense, will be remembered not only that we run out of IPv4 addresses and maybe not only that we surpassed the, you know, 7 billion uh, people border living on this planet. Maybe also not that, you know, Bill Gay, uh, Steve, sorry, Steve Jobs, uh, you know, died, but really that we are able to support the capacity which, uh, which Steve Jobs, as a, as a matter of fact, left as a legacy for us to crunch over the next, uh, the next five, ten years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Misa. And now it's time for questions, so I open the the microphone to the floor for any question. There is a question. For Ronaldo, you might have a question. <coughs> sure, a couple of questions. Um, you've yes, focused. Uh, uh, excuse me. I would appreciate if, if uh, for questions, uh, you could say your name or, or your company. So. Uh, Jonathan Smith, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I have a couple questions. One is, uh, how do you overcome some of the real estate challenges in urban environments? Because you have building material penetration challenges at some of the higher frequencies, number one. And number two, the problem with very small cells is, uh, um, um, mobility in the sense that you can have people walking between cells and you have handoff challenges that uh, uh, are latency related. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, handoff challenges and building materials? Okay, thank you. So the, um, that's your phone again, right? The, um, 
So the first point is the uh, penetration. So we have actually calculated, so the whole analysis we have done on the capacity needs, on the link budgets, on the density of the uh, stations uh, has been done with a penetration loss. Not only that, we have not taken the standard models which are out there, which are the winner models, et cetera, you know, the uh, Stanford propagation models. We have actually used our own propagation models simply because the narrow beam width, uh, you know, which is a few degrees only, will completely change your, your propagation behavior. So that is all calculated, we've taken care of that. What I invite you to do is just go to the deliverables, most of them are actually public, and you can follow the whole calculation. Now, um, I shall add that we have not tried to challenge, let's say in residential areas or in very heavy commercial areas, the femtocells. So that is something which is left apart and has not been included actually in in this calculation. It's really a microcell, literally a very microcell approach and uh, propagation has been considered. Now, another thing you have been alluding to very, very quickly is the actual problem of mounting the access base stations to the public infrastructure, let's say, okay? Yeah, that is an issue, but cities have become much more susceptible to the problem, okay? So it is at Barcelona, for instance, and many cities in Europe are completely Wi-Fi. So if you come to Barcelona, I'm not sure about Madrid, you see uh, you know, every 200 meters a really big, ugly Wi-Fi station, which is, uh, so people get used to that, even though the antennas and stuff like that. So the town hall's getting there, so the putting the actual antennas was never an issue, and uh, I think that is something which the operators can actually resolve with those who own the, uh, the infrastructure. Also, the radiation powers are much lower than just putting a, a big thing uh, very often on the rooftops. So the hub base station is very high and theoretically a little bit out of the shooting line of citizens. Now, the um, uh, internet, we also calculate all the safety issues, all, all that is all, can all be found in the deliverables. Now, the, uh, the, the second or third question you had on the uh, handovers, yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's a very good question because the technology we use, particularly in this uh, project, is, uh, you know, is WiMAX-based technology. Now, the WiMAX community is an IEEE community, which is very good in providing data raises, but is a bit lousy in actually uh, facilitating handovers. Uh, the same as maybe the 3GPP community is very good in handovers, mobility, roaming, but maybe not so good in uh, you know, providing high data rates, uh, but things are converging. So therefore, I'm not particularly worried about this. Microcells uh, run today. Um, Handovers are there. Most of the time when you really download heavy stuff, the five megabits per second I was alluding to, uh, you don't travel very quickly, okay? So you would rather sit in a coffee shop somewhere and actually enjoy it. So um, it is, I believe, a minor problem as of today, okay? Thank you. Hello? Yes. <laughs> So I'm David Soldani from uh, uh, Huawei Technologies, and uh, I saw your simulations about this um, algorithm, and I would like to know how you're going to control this learning period, because you need a few, several transactions, which I think operators will not accept. Yeah, so, so question. I think that basically I've been studying these problems for <laughs> several years, and we couldn't manage practically, I mean, in the past. Mm. Not in Huawei. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from Nokia before, mm -hmm. and the main challenge was the learning period. How you train your yes. algorithm? Yes. What kind yes. of algorithm you are using, and how you avoid these uh, tremendous oscillations yeah. that dramatically deteriorate the performance, the experience of the end user. Yes. Okay. No, so I worked for France Telecom before, and we had the same problem. So every time you showed them the convergence graphs, they were saying, uh, "No way," you know, and. Um, so that's why we started working on something which would significantly reduce actually the convergence times. Um, so two things here, you asked for the specific algorithms we used, I didn't want to present that today. So we used uh, uh, one of the typical uh, reinforcement algorithms which is Q learning, which has a, a Q table. So you have an input matrix which is what, what is happening and output that matrix what you should be doing, okay? So um, it's like, uh, you know, you learn on the run essentially by trial and error and which is the reason why it takes so long to actually get it converged uh, in the uh, actual machine learning uh, community. And the other problem is if something changes on the input or statistics, the whole output doesn't hold anymore and everything goes berserk, which is why you have the whole fluctuations. Now, that's why we introduced the dosative paradigm. What do we do? Um, you are somebody, you are a base station which has learned what's happening in this environment, including 
these really bizarre, bizarre uh, fluctuations which are happening on the run, okay? So there are some parts in the table which are reserved for this really weird stuff which gives you all these fluctuations because there are some uh, uh, you know, non-nagotic things happening in the network. Now, you're running there and you have clearly built up an expertise because you're running longer or you have shown to have uh, less oscillations, that is all measured. You have, in a sense, a higher IQ, so we've quantified that, okay? The moment we see that your IQ is bigger than my IQ, we start exchanging knowledge. And we don't exchange knowledge in the sense like, you know, you're not telling me, oh, if this happens, I do this. No, this is not what we're exchanging. We're exchanging neurons, we're exchanging the actual Q table entries. So I get your brain and put it in my brain, and uh, because uh, presumably the uh, propagation environment and all the, uh, uh, all the conditions are very similar, I will start performing very similar to you, and I'll be starting to learn also my time. And again, if now it turns out that I'm uh, more intelligent than you, I'll pass it on to you. And this propagates, this intelligence propagates essentially through the network, and what we call dosition from the, from the word dos, uh, dosera to teach. Cogn cognition comes from cognition to learn, and dosera to teach, okay? So really the emphasis is put away from the learning, but rather to the teaching. Try to spread good knowledge as quickly as possible through the network. And you see immediately that the coherence, uh, the oscillations go down. The variance, I haven't shown this, we have quantified it. Variance goes down significantly, and the, uh, the uh, convergence times go down to a level which are already interesting to, uh, to real-time deployments. Yeah, so for every, for every new situation, yeah, yeah, I understand. How is statistically reliable? Okay, so you, you just multiply, if you take three GPP uh, parameters, let's say uh, 10 milliseconds, uh, you know, transmission uh, TTIs and, uh, or meaningfully packet transmission where you can really learn something on the run, multiplied by 4,000 iterations, this is what you get. Okay, so you do the math very quickly. So it's, uh, it's less than 10 minutes, okay? And every time there comes a situation which happens, happens to be different from what you had, again, you, you learn, but you don't forget about it. You're not erasing that. That is memory which stays in there, okay? That's the beauty of it. If you want to know more about other simulations, just come to see me, I'll, I'll give you. It works, you know? Yes. And we're actually putting it through to Etsy Brand, so if you want to really be, uh, I actually recommend you just take part in the, uh, in the phone conf or conference next Tuesday. Okay, th thank you very much, Misha. Okay.